one. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hi, Tanya. Hi. <laughs> yeah. Hi. It says Cheryl, but I know who y'all are. <laughs> Yes. It'll start live in just a minute. It's, okay. it's live now. Hi, Sister Brenda. Okay. All right, we're going to go and get started. Let's have a word of prayer. Hello. Father, we are so grateful for this another opportunity to call upon your name. We're so grateful, oh God, for all your blessings and mercies. We're so grateful, God, for... Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. We come to hide it in our hearts so we won't sin against you. We now give ourselves to you, God, for this hour. We take this moment seriously as we share your word, oh God. We want your word to be clear that you not only anoint my, my mouth to speak the truths of your word, but you anoint the hearers, the ears of the hearers tonight so we might join in together and hear from you. We need a word from you, Lord. Yes. We need a word. We need you to breathe. We need a fresh touch. We stand in need of your presence because so much is going on in our society. So much is going on in our world. The world is turned upside down. We need you to step in, Lord, and bring peace in the streets. Peace in the streets, oh God, please. Peace in our leaders' minds. The, with the disease still running rampant. And people are going out. And spread them all. We need you, God, to step in and turn back the disasters that's happening. We had no way else to look. We know you had the power to do it. So we call in your name as your children. Have mercy. And we just commit ourselves to you, O oh God, for this time of study. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Blessings on everybody. Blessings, blessings. God's been such a wonderful keeper. We are um, going to pick up in chapter 7 once again. We stopped off at verse 7-7 um, seven, seven on last week. And um, I was talking about, um, well, the scripture was talking about our relation to the law. We found out we're in this new relationship where we die with Christ and we are risen with him to walk in newness of life. All right? And our relationship, we found out, our relationship to sin has been changed. We've died into sin, we live under God, but our relationship to the law has also changed. Because the law had dominance over us. The law has dominance over all men until death. So we found out last week we died. Through the body of Christ, we died with him by identification. Now we live to walk in of life. So Paul continues in this uh, thought concerning the law. And we're going to move on a little bit further and he mentioned, I mentioned the last couple times, he talked about um, the law coming. He talked about how um, he discovered covetousness in verse 7. He, let me just start in verse 7 and read down. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? He's asking a question. And then he answers, as God forbid, or may it never be. Nay, he said, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust." Except the law said, thou shalt not covet. So he associates um, the 10th commandment is thou shalt not covet. And in the Exodus, he names covering thy neighbor's animals, a neighbor's wife, a neighbor's and the other. And Paul, in his own experience, found out through this particular, um, and we find out through this particular um, commandment not to covet, it comes last, but it sums all. Because uh, coveting is to set our affections on something that's not ours. Uh, to set our affections on something someone else has. And I found myself, even the other day, uh, Mike and I do walking. Um, we try to walk just about every day. We walk in some of the neighborhoods that are nearby. And I kept looking at how nice the yards were and how big the houses were. And I found myself saying, gee, if I could just live in one of those houses. And God just reminded me, well, you already have a house. And he said, stop coveting. Be content with the things you have. Because you can set your mind on things and not realize. So what I'm trying to say about this particular sin, all the other sins you can see, adultery you can see, uh, stealing you can see. But when it comes to inner attitudes, so Paul talks about not 
being caught up in the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law, he letting us know that it's not enough not to commit the sin. It's about the heart attitude. Jesus even taught that the Pharisees thought they were doing well by not committing adultery. But he said, if you look on a woman with lust in your heart, you committing sin in your heart. So it brings the law, the spirit of the law is not just the actions, but it's also the heart attitudes. So we stand before God like that, a law like that, we realize that all of us fall short because we're full of coveting. Amen. <laughs> we're full of things that we don't even realize that we're doing. So the law condemns us. So Paul is saying when the law really came, he will see no limit. He said, I died. When the law came, it, it killed me because the wage of sin is death. I had a death penalty upon my head. But he says in verse 8, but sin taken occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of uh, concupiscence, which is evil desire. For without the law, sin is dead. So what is he saying? He said just the fact that something within us, this sin nature that, that, that's within us, this flesh that, that, that uh, lives in us, this nature of ours, it doesn't like to be told what it can't do. Can I get just one amen? amen? It does not like rules. It does not like governance. It doesn't like to be told it can't do things. And when you tell it it can't do things, it's draw, it makes the temptation more alluring. That's what happened in the Garden of Eden. God said, have all the trees except this one. And Satan comes around and says what? God didn't want you having that because you'd be like him. He, he brought that enticement because in our pride, in our uh, curiosity, we don't like rules and regulations. We don't like someone giving us something, but God gives us lines. He draws the line. He draws what's acceptable because he wants us to know no matter where we go, who we are, he is still God. Amen. He's in control. So um, this desire, this evil desire, so the law is not bad. And Paul's going to talk about that. The law is not sinful. We are messed up. But just the fact that the law is right and it's holy and it's just and it's good, but we are not. And therefore, the law gives knowledge of sin. It shows us our real condition. You know, we don't always know that. We don't always realize that. I was thinking... Um, well, I'll, I'll leave illustration for later on. I thought about an illustration earlier that I would share a little later on. I want to move on a little bit. Verse 9, uh, for I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. So Paul's reflecting on his own life. And this could have been a time before he became a Pharisee or the fact he's describing, as you see in Philippians 3, he said he was a Pharisee of Pharisees as keeping the law he considered himself being blameless. And he was in a state where he felt like he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. And that's the state of mind he had when he persecuted the truth. He was religious, but he was unsaved. Knowledgeable, but unsaved. But when the commandment really came, when he really heard the commandment, he realized that he was now under a death penalty. He says, I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, he said, sin revived. Because of God's law, I really understood. He says, I died. So we know it's not talking about a literal death because we have verse 10, right? If he said, I died in verse 9, we wouldn't have a verse 10, would we? Mm -hmm. So not talking about a literal death. He's speaking of a spiritual death. He realized that what the law did condemned him to death. All right? In verse 10, he says, the commandment, uh, and the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death commandment that God gave and he even said in the Old Testament if a man does these things you'll live by them but yet man could never step up to God's um, rules God's laws so no man lived by it all right what the law did was the law ushered us to a place of realizing that we need a savior and we'll come across that as we read a little further down in this chapter for sin for sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it slew me. He explained himself. I understand God's laws reach deeper than just my act, but also reach into my intentions. 
So by God's very command, sin aroused up in me and it deceived me. How many realize, uh, what did Jeremiah say? The heart is desperate. Jeremiah, I think it's um, Jeremiah 17, 9, about how desperately wicked the heart is. Who can know it? Sin will deceive us. We can actually think we're doing right and not be doing right. We can actually think we're praying right or doing religious things right and not be right because sin will deceive us. Because we can sometimes do the right stuff for the wrong reasons. i never forget years ago, I was really into um, one of the radio ministers. He's still around, but not as popular as he used to be. I won't call his name. I remember him saying something that really disturbed me. He said one day, I listened to him for, for a long time, he said he doesn't care about motivation. He just does what's right. He don't care about, doesn't matter to him what the motive is behind it. And it disturbed me because I, you know, because God is all about motive. God is all about the heart. God is all about, you know, what the heart is about. The heart of the matter is the heart, right? The real us. And a couple weeks later, he was caught in adultery and lost his big men. So we need to be concerned about everything because anybody is subject to fall into sin. All right? Anybody can fall into sin. But the whole thing is that we want to live our lives so controlled by God's spirit that we won't fall into these kind of things. Anybody can be subject to these things. Don't think the Bible talks about don't don't you know, don't think too much of yourself that you won't fall because you can fall. And when we see other people falling, we're not supposed to have a condemning attitude because, but to try to restore them in the spirit of meekness because the same thing could happen to me. How would I want to be treated if I fell? You know, and that brings something to my mind. And I want to address that also. The church ought to be a place of healing and restoration. But it's become a place where people are not comfortable to share enough and be transparent. Because if we are too transparent, we feel like people will judge us, judge us and condemn us, but that's the place for transparency. The Bible says we ought to confess our faults one to another and pray one for another. But it's not a, uh, uh, I, you know, it's not always a, a atmosphere conducive to that because we realize that everybody in church is not really in God. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. And everybody in the, in the group are not always spiritual enough to understand what someone is sharing. It's not to carry it. It's to bury it. Amen. Amen. When someone is sharing intimate things about themselves or something they don't want other people to know, it's not for us to spread it. It's for us to bear, to pray for them, offer them scripture and prayer, cry with them, weep with them, mourn with them, and ask God for restoration. But we become so superficial and so concerned about the outside of the cup, and Jesus corrected the Pharisees for this, for they were concerned about the outside of the cup. He called them a white, white, whitewashed tombstones. He says, you take care of the outside of the cup, but the inside is full of dead man's bones. You, you, you whitewash things, but the inside is not right. But this Christianity, this life in Christ is definitely an inside job. It's an inside job that works its way out to change our behavior. The proof of our, we ought to always want to see proof that we're walking with God and proof that we're living for God. You know, if, you, if you're walking with God, the Bible says that you'll love people. The Bible says that you'll even love your enemies. So I'm always searching my heart before God and come before God to make sure there's no spots because especially I check the areas where I know people have done wrong things to me. And I ask God, Lord, if there's some spot, what can I do to, uh, what can I do to bring peace? What can I do to be a peacemaker? What can I do to let People that wrong me know that I'm not mad with them. I'm not uh, mad. I'm not, I'm not angry. I don't have anything against them, but I just want to move on. And so these are kind of attitudes that are searching in our lives because there's a spirit of, I used to call it years ago, get back spirit. 
There's a spirit that dwells in us and wants to strike back at those who have struck and stricken us. There's a spirit that's there that wants to uh, be hostile, that wants to be um, um, vindictive, that wants to repay. But the Lord says, vengeance is mine, I'll repay. That doesn't mean I sit back in my window and watch <laughs> God take my enemy down. <laughs> that just means that God's going to take care of it. I don't have to, I don't have to get involved. And meanwhile, what I need to do is make sure there's nothing between my soul and my Savior. Amen. I can't do anything about how they feel because you know what? You can't make people accept you in any way. And uh, trying to spend time trying to make them accept you and prove to them things is not going to get you anywhere. But what you have to do is bring yourself before God. If there's any offering that you can do, anything you can do to soothe it, he says, live at peace with all men. Bless a lot of peacemakers. Amen. Amen. So that's something we have to deal with. Because love is a serious thing, y'all. Y'all know the Bible says love fulfills all the law. And if we uh, say we love God who we haven't seen, how can we hate the neighbor that we do see? But God has called us. Y'all hear what I'm saying to you? He's called us to love the unlovely. Amen. Amen. He's called us not just to love the ones that we that like us and we like them and we hang with them. No, he's called the mission is to love the unlovely because that's what the Lord did with us. I know I got a witness somewhere out there. Amen. Remember what I told you? If you're on Facebook, thumbs up is amen. A heart is hallelujah. <laughs> amen. amen. Because God has shown so much grace towards us. That we should be showing the same grace and mercy to others. So sin is deceptive. And we oftentimes deal with its trickery and we even fool our own selves. The devil doesn't have to deceive us. We fool ourselves. But it takes time, y'all. Y'all hear what I'm saying to you tonight? It takes time in the presence of God. It takes time. In his word, Jesus said, sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is true. It takes time in the word of God, amen, to sanctify, be sanctified through the truth of God and by the spirit of God to peel away those things in us that are not like God so we can be more equipped vessels to do his will. Amen. amen. That's why I spend time in his presence asking him to forgive me and to cleanse me and to Help me, because we need to save yourself. This this thing, flesh, this is a serious situation. Because this is part two of what we're talking about. The struggle is real. Amen. If you are a child of God, you know what I'm talking about. The struggle that we go through is real. Because people can say some stuff and do some stuff that want to pull you out of what you came from. But God has called us to be peacemakers. Amen. So it can be the same. Verse 12. Wherefore, I'm in verse 12, uh, 7 and 12. Wherefore, the law is holy. There's no problem with the law. Yeah, we hear the rules. We don't want rules. You know what? Can we be honest? We are rebels at heart. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we we want to do it our way, right? Mm -hmm. Before we came to Christ, we thought we was doing it our way, but we're really serving the devil. You're going to be somebody's fool. Mm -hmm. Amen. You, you, you might as well serve the Lord because you're going to serve somebody. Some people try to walk half and half, but that's not going to make it. If you're trying to be half and half, you're not going to be friends on either side. The devil can't trust you and God can't trust you. <laughs> <laughs> so you might as well step all the way over. Amen. Amen. Just step all, take your neighbor, step all the way over. <laughs> Come on all the way over. You might as well give yourself all the way over to God. Why play church? Why play with this thing? Why go to hell with church shoes on? <laughs> Amen. Don't play with the thing. Tell God, tell God, I want to be all of yours. Talk to him like that. I want to be all truly yours. I tell you, the you know, 
And the closer you get with him, the more inadequate you feel in and of yourself. But Second uh, Corinthians uh, that not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything is of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Isn't that good news? Amen. Every time I get nervous, I think about that verse. Because God tells me, hey, it's not even about you. <laughs> it's about me in you. Amen. Yeah. He told Zerubbabel in Zechariah, he said, it's not by power, nor by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. <laughs> Who art thy old mountain before Zerubbabel? I'm going to make you a plain. I'm going to make you flat. No matter how big the mountain is, when well, you've got God in your, in, your, in your heart and in your life, no matter how big the mountain is, God is able to give you victory. How many believe that? Yeah. We're going to come to chapter 8 of Romans soon, and we're going to hear over there that you're more than a conqueror. Woo! How, what does that mean to you, more than a conqueror? Not just a conqueror, but a super conqueror. You are more than a conqueror through him that loved you. And I'll explain it like this. The conqueror, listen to me good. The conqueror, you hear it again. I'm going to tell it just like I never told you. The conqueror is the one that goes out to fight the battle. Right? The more than the conqueror is the one that enjoys the victory. Oh, y'all didn't hear what I said to you. Amen. So we already won. <laughs> oh, listen to this one. Listen to this one. Illustrate this real good. There, uh, how many look at, uh, how many like looking at wrestling? No, what's it called? The wrestling on the, the uh, UFC. USC, the wrestling. Uh, my son and my father-in-law used to look at that years ago. And I walk in the room and I said, I can't look at that. That's all set up. Y'all know it's set up right. It's scripted. WWE. WWE. What is it, WWE? Yeah, WWE. The scripted one. Not the real wrestling, but scripted wrestling. It's all scripted. You know who's going to win. Already paid the, pay the people to lose. Throwing across them, they throw them across the stage and fall out, and somebody, you know, it's all theatrics, and I could never look at it. It never, I could never get into. It. I knew it was theatrics, but the thing of it is, what I'm trying to say to you today: What if you knew that the fight was fixed? Oh, I wish I had some music behind me right now. <laughs> <laughs> what if you knew the fight that you're in? has been fixed. Or you might get thrown around a little bit. You might get some bruises and some scars. But in the end, because I read the end of the book, the fight's fixed. Amen. And we got the victory. Amen. So you don't fight for the victory. That's a struggle. I got to fight to get over. You fight from the victory. You fight already knowing that you got the victory. Amen through Jesus Christ. Just say hallelujah. I'm gonna, let me hear some feedback. That's, a, that's shouting right there. Amen. The fight is fixed. Jesus Christ already won the victory. We're more than the conqueror because he fought the battle for us. That's good news. Amen. So he says here in verse 12 again, Wherefore the law is holy, the commandment is holy, just and good. There's nothing wrong with God's law. All the wrongs in us. He says, was then that which is good made death unto me? Did God take the law and make it death? No, it says, God forbid. It says, but sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that the sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. So what is he saying? He's saying the law didn't make you sinful. The law shows you you were sinful. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, uh, a magnifying glass. You know, you look at some stuff, we would look, if we had the magnifying glass, even better. If I look at my hand with my glasses on, all I see is my hands. But if I put my hands under a microscope, I would see there was bacteria and germs, all those other things, under my nails and everything else. That microscope didn't make my fingers dirty. All it did was show my real condition. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. It's almost like, you know, 
Some of us don't like getting on a scale. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but guess what? Getting on a scale, off a scale, doesn't determine my weight. But all the scale does is show me my true condition. Doesn't make me lose the weight or gain the weight. All it does is show me my true condition. And that's what happens with the, with the laws of God. God gave a law. It's holy. It's good. But because we are sinful, Paul's going to say it in a minute, and I'll read down to it. We'll see. All right. So that which is good wasn't, didn't become sin, but it showed us that we were sinful. Verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am what? Carnal, sold under sin. The law is spiritual. The law is more than just uh, reading uh, thou shalt not commit adultery. The law is more than that. It's given by a spiritual God and it deals with the heart of man. What about what's the heart of the man? But I'm carnal. I'm fleshly. And that which is born of flesh is flesh. And I wish I could tell you as a child of God on this side of heaven. That one day your flesh will get saved. Or one day your flesh is going to act better. I'll be lying to you. Because you cannot train it. It makes demands on us. It causes us to, drives us to uh, go beyond what's necessary. Say beyond what's necessary. Act out beyond what's necessary. We cannot get rid of it, but God has given us a remedy to keep it controlled, under control, all right? Mm -hmm. By spiritual laws. The law of God's spirit in us is more powerful than the law of sin and death. Mm -hmm. And Paul's going to talk about that as we go on a little bit further. Now, Paul goes into a, um, the strife of these natures. You know, now that we're uh, saved, and now that we found out in chapter 6 that we've been crucified with Christ, chapter 7 tells us about the struggle, chapter 8 tells us about the victory, all right? So we're in the struggling part right now, all right? Paul says this, and I, we did this once before, but I'm going to do it again, because I think it's right where we live at. For that which I do, I allow not. For that, for for that which I do, I allow not. Or what I would do, I allow not. All right? We're going to notice in this particular chapter, this particular section, Paul uses a lot of personal pronouns, I, 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 I. And sometimes he's talking about two different eyes. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would do, that I do not. But what I hate that I do. All of us have been there before. All right? I want to do the right thing. I made my mind to do the right thing. But I wind up doing the wrong thing. I know what's right. But I don't have the power to do what's right. All right? So we can call this Paul. We can call this particular section um, helpless, helpless state. He uh, starts off. Uh, man starts off being hostile toward the things of God. Then he tries to do right, but he's helpless because he wants to do what's right, but he has no power to do the right thing. Does that sound familiar? Paul says, it's not the things I don't like. He says, the things I hate, I do. How can you hate something and still do it? <laughs> Paul says, I do the things I hate. I, I hate the things I do. He says, verse 16, if then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it's good. So I'm saying I agree the law is good, but I'm not good. I'm doing the things I don't want to do. 
I consent. I say the law is good. So we didn't know what God wants us to do and still not do it. Our problem is not knowing. The problem with us is not that we don't know. The problem is we don't do. But it takes power to do. Jesus Christ not only died for the penalty of sin, he also died to break the power of sin. Look, both will go hand in hand. Let me cite you an example, all right? Let's suppose um, I had a drug problem and I got arrested for doing drugs. They put me in jail. Beverly came by and she paid the price for me to get out of jail. She posted my, my bail to get me out. I still got a problem, right? The penalty has been paid, but I still got a problem. I have an addiction. So I not only need the penalty paid, I need the power broken. Well, I'm going to do what? I'm going to keep going back to the same place over and over again. Well, Jesus Christ, isn't that good news? Jesus Christ not only paid the penalty, he also paid the price for the power. And this is what these chapters are dealing with, the power. The presence of sin is there with us, going to be with us until we see Jesus. But the power of sin can be broken. And so we have to learn to see ourselves in the light of this and understand that there is a real struggle. Most of us understand that. There's a real struggle. Even to the place where things that we thought we were over. I know I got at least one witness out there. Things that we thought we were beyond, those things will rise up and try to take us back in bondage again. It's just like, you know, because the flesh is going to always be there and it's going to be demanding. It's going to be like that hungry child that wants to be fed. And going to yell at you saying, you know, all right, you did good today. Now you let it happen. <laughs> That's how deceptive uh, the flesh is. And how many people ever? How many people started to die? <laughs> Y'all quiet on me now. <laughs> I start. I think I start to die every day. <laughs> but guess what? <laughs> it's not the starting of the diet. It's the carrying out of the plan consistently. Amen. That's what matters. It's how we finish the diet. The flesh is always going to be demanding of us, always going to be trying to deceive us, but by the word of God and the power of God, we will hear Paul cry out in a minute, and I'll be our cry, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me? And we realize that's the point of, that's the point of a turnaround. When we see our true condition is a point of the, tur of the turnaround. He says, verse 17, um, now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that what? Dwelleth in me. Sin has a home. Dwell means to make a house. I said to you a, a couple weeks ago, it is a true statement to think about. In Christ, we have a new identity, but we have the same address. In Christ, we're new in Christ Jesus but we still live in these same bodies. And these bodies will not, Romans 8 is going to tell us that, will not be redeemed until we see Jesus Christ. So although we've been redeemed, we've made, any man being Christ, he, uh, is it 1 Corinthians 5, 17? 2 Corinthians 5, 17? 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If any man being Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We're new. We've been given a new spirit. The Holy Spirit has now come to live in us. All right? Mm -hmm. But these bodies and the nature of these bodies still crave the things of the old life. And so we are imprisoned in a dead body or a dead uh, nature. Imprisons or, or houses us. But Paul has told us in this, particular, in this context, we read it a little while ago, now that we are saved by God, no longer yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness, but yield yourself to God. 
So we're no longer going to yield to the things of the flesh, but we're to yield to God. Will we have times we fall and stumble? Yes, we will. But there's a remedy for that too. You have a lawyer, you have an intercessor, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. You have an avenue for restoration through confession of sins and forsaking of sins. You have, we have avenues for that. See, heaven is not going to be a place for perfect people, but heaven is a place for people who are being perfected. Somebody asked me on uh, one of the social medias, uh, they said, well, they, they're not going to believe in Jesus. They just, they just going to live a good life and uh, do good stuff and then go to heaven. I said to them, well, good people don't go to heaven. Saved people go to heaven. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, this guy said he was an atheist. I said, matter of fact, heaven shouldn't even matter to you. Because <laughs> you don't even believe as a God. And he never responded to me. People think that, people think that the way this goes is, I just live the best I can. And if I get enough good points, and my good points outweigh my bad points, God's gonna let me in heaven. Nope. Even some Christian, even some church goers feel that way. They feel like I'm I know I got some issues, but I'm not that bad. The Bible says all of us are jacked up. <laughs> The Bible says none are good, none are righteous, no, not one. And we got to understand as children of God, as God's children, we're only God's children by his grace and mercy. Mm -hmm. That's it. Great. That's the only difference between me and someone who doesn't know God is God's grace and mercy. That's all. I'm not better. I'm no better. I'm no better of a human being. I'm just a person that's been saved by God's grace and God's glory, loving the Lord, and because I'm saved, I want to reflect his glory. That ought to be our heart cry. If you are a child of God, the spirit of God that lives in you drives you to become a better person in Christ. The presence of sin is there. The power of sin is real. We no longer have to answer the door. Amen. Amen. So now we as children of God, we are not only supposed to be training and knowledgeable, we have to realize that with the training and knowledge comes responsibility. We have to take personal responsibility for our actions. And the, I was reading a little while about, about Cain and Abel. You know, um, Cain killed the right thing. But God told, told Abel in chapter 4 of Genesis, he says, if you do well, You'll be accepted. In other words, if you do what I ask you to do, you'll be accepted like your brother. But he says, if not, he says, sin crouches at the door. And unto you shall be its desire. But you must master, you must master it. He told Cain that if you do the wrong thing, sin is like a lion crouching at the door waiting to devour you. Isn't that a good illustration of what sin is? It's standing there at the door waiting to devour, waiting to consume us. But we as children of God got to know we don't have to fear it. We have to know it's there. And we have to know our resource. Our resource is of God. God is the one that gives us the victory. Y'all understand? I hope, I hope I'm coming across clear. It is all about God. God not only saves us, but God keeps us. God empowers us. You know what the Bible says? In uh, yes. Matthew 5, Jesus gave the what we call the Beatitudes or the state of being, living a blessed life or a joyous life. The first thing he says is blessed are the poor in spirit. This word for poor doesn't mean a little broke. This word poor means this person has nothing in spirit. This person realizes their real condition. And I am thoroughly convinced the more that we see our real condition, the stronger we'll grow because then we can grow from that point. We recognize that spiritually, in and of myself, I am bankrupt. I have nothing to offer. But because God is in me, I'm now depending. Remember what Paul said? Paul had a thorn in the flesh and we don't know what it was. You remember what Paul said? He, he prayed to God. Ask God to remove the thorn. Ask God to take it away. Ask three times. But God didn't take away the thorn. God said, I'm going to give you grace. My grace is sufficient for you. Then Paul realized what God was doing. God didn't take it away because God wanted Paul dependent on him. 
And I would ask God sometimes, well, God, this stuff has been with me since a child. Why does why why can't I get through this? Why why these same things come to my mind? Why do I have these bad thoughts? Why I'm asking why why? And God reminds me that He's given me grace enough. See, God doesn't just let you go in the fire by yourself. Mm-hmm. What did He say? No temptation that have taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. Amen. He will not allow you to be tempted above with that what, which are able. But with the temptation, also wait, make a way out, a way to escape. God would not allow you to be tempted. He would not allow anything to come to you that you cannot handle. Which lets me know that God is blocking some stuff from us until we're ready to handle it. Amen. What did he tell Peter? He says, Peter, Satan has desired to have you, to sift you as wheat. But Jesus said, I prayed for you. Aren't y'all glad today? I just rejoice because God is blocking some stuff that I can't handle right now, preparing me for a future. And don't you know, the more you grow, the stronger the tests become. And the stronger the test, the more we experience the greatness of God. So Paul said, I glory in my weaknesses. That sounds crazy. Paul said, I now glory in my weaknesses. Because when I'm weak, I'm strong. What God is doing is teaching us not independence, but he's teaching us dependence, mm-hmm. depending upon him for what we need. I always say this. I said it for years and years. The strong Christian is not the one who thinks they have it together. Mm-hmm. The strong Christian is the one who knows they have nothing, but God is everything. Mm-hmm. Amen. Amen. Uh, he's our sufficiency. We get stronger as we lean harder. Amen. Amen. So the more dependent I am on him, the stronger I look. People will look and say, you sure are strong. And I turn back and say, no, he sure is strong. (laughs) Amen. Amen. People say, "You, you sure are doing the thing right. I said, no, it's him in me. Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but it's Christ that lives in me. The more I die, the more I live. Amen. Yeah. Amen. The more I die to me, because you know we rebels at heart, the more I die to me, you realize it's not about my kingdom, it is about his kingdom. Being kingdom minded. He says, seek you first the kingdom. That's be kingdom minded. Realize that God is seeking to build a kingdom and he's using you and I to build that kingdom. Amen. He says, seek, let the kingdom be your priority. Let the kingdom of God dominate your mindset. Not what I want. God may, uh, I may get sick and go to the hospital. But while I'm there, I've got to be asking God, how can you be glorified in this? By healing me instantly or giving me grace to sustain me or bringing me into your presence. Paul said this. Paul said this. He said, to live is Christ. To die is Is gain. Paul said when he lives or died, he wanted Christ to be glorified in his body. By life or by death. That doesn't sound like something preaching here today. Give me more houses and land and I declare you to be rich and I declare, you know, you supposed to prosper and everything. Paul didn't live that kind of life. Jesus didn't live that kind of life. So I'm looking at the founder of this whole thing. He said, Foxes have holes and birds have nests. But the son of man don't have a place to lay his head. I'm looking at the leader of this thing saying it was put in a barn tomb. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And you know he only needed to borrow it. Because <laughs> he wasn't standing for three days. So the, the Christianity that's preached today, I look on the internet and I see all these people declaring stuff. And declaring stuff and declaring all this good stuff to people, and their crowds are multiplying, declaring, declaring their prosperity, declaring you to call your a new house and call a new home. Is that really God's kingdom? Mm-hmm. Is God trying to bring us heaven on earth, or is he trying to let us represent heaven on earth? Amen. We're supposed to be representatives of him. If he gives us a lot, that's fine. But if he gives us nothing, he gives us little, that's fine. Because it's not about what we want, it's about what God wants. Mm-hmm. 
Amen. Amen. He said this. He said, godliness with contentment is much gain. Yes. Having food and clothing, he said, be content. Mm -hmm. But the desire to be rich will bring many snares. Mm -hmm. People always got these get rich quick schemes. All this kind of me, you know, join this with me and all. No, I'm all right. I'm cool. <laughs> I'm cool. <laughs> I'm just going to let God do what he want to do. Amen. 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 He said, man, he, I didn't even finish the rest of that verse. He said, seek first the kingdom of God. And I didn't finish that verse. He says, and his righteousness. Want to live right. Amen. Amen. Want to live right. Seek him. Live for him. And he says, all these things shall be added to you. You don't have to worry about calling houses and telling money to come to you and you don't have to worry about all that stuff. If God sees a bird fall to the ground, will he not take care of me? His eye hallelujah, is on the sparrow and I know he watches me. If God would take the time to number the very hairs that are on our head, he knows how much fell off. Surely he knows. If he would clothe the lilies of the field in such beauty and color, and they're here today and gone tomorrow, will he not clothe me? So I don't have to worry about food and clothing and shelter. I want to seek his kingdom and his righteousness, and he'll take care of all the everything else will fall in place. Amen. I hear it over and over. Amen. People are, it's, I've never seen so many people prophesying over people's lives. Maybe, I, I, you know, in proclaiming these things in people's lives. I told God, let them proclaim what they proclaim. That's between you and them. I'm going to proclaim the word of God. Amen. I'm going to proclaim the word of God and let the word of God tell you who you are and what you have and the power he's given to you. Proclaim God's word. Amen. Amen. He says here in verse 13, was then that which was uh, is good made death unto me? God forbid for sin. Take my glass off the seat. But sin that it might appear sin, working death in me, by which that is good, that sin made by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. So the commandment showed me who I showed the real condition of men. Verse 14. Um, oh, I'm down further than that. I'm in the eyes. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm down here in the eyes. <laughs> I'm in verse um, 19, I think, wasn't it? You want 17. 17? All right. Let's move down to 17. Thank you. Now there's no more I to do, but sin to do in me. For I know the in me that's in my flesh. Thank you. For I know the in me that is in my flesh. Paul is saying this. I know the in me that is in my flesh dwelleth what? No good thing. In my flesh. The fleshy part of me, I got to know this. No good thing dwells there. For to will is present with me. I want to do it. I got the will to do it. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. This is a struggle. I want to do right. But I found myself not doing right. Doing the stuff I hate. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I. So Paul got all these two different eyes. The, the eye that's uh, saved and then the eye that's not, so, not acting saved. No more I do, but he says this. He says this sin that dwelleth in me. That's my flesh, right? And he's talked about being new inside, having a new identity, but the old address. So be aware that the sin that dwells in us, it tries to control us. But we have to recognize that in Christ, we'll get to that part. Thank you. We'll get to that part and we read on. 
we will get to this part that tells us that we are the ones that God changes. And when he changes us, he then changes, then he uses us to change the behavior. Y'all follow that? He starts inside. He doesn't start by giving you outer rules because outer rules don't change inside. But he comes into our hearts and writes his laws on our hearts. And once our hearts are changed, our hands will change. All right? So we have a clean heart but dirty hands. And what God wants to do is take that clean heart and now let that clean heart by the God, Spirit of God, start to do the right kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Not to let the flesh do what it wants to do. But let it know. Paul said he keeps under his body and brings it in subjection. Bringing the body by it. We'll find out in the power of God's Spirit, we put the deeds of the flesh to death by the power of God's Spirit who's in us. So the Spirit of God, notice in this chapter, Paul didn't mention the Holy Spirit not one time. But the next chapter... It's like Holy Spirit everywhere because he's bringing us to the point of realizing that we cannot do this in and of our own strength. It is the power of God that lives in us that gives to us the victory. Amen. 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 Bring us to a place of realizing blessed are those who are poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed is that person that realizes that in and of his or herself they have no power but in Christ they can do all things. Yeah. And so where is the boasting? Nobody can brag about that, about what I did and what I can do. Our boast will always be in the Lord. Amen. Amen. So we're going to stop and close it up right here at um, verse 21. All right. I want to give space for any questions or comments before we have our closing prayer. Anybody have any questions, comments, concerns? Everybody quiet. This is your time to ask me questions and concerns. So I, I, I would behoove you to go back and read this whole chapter and be ready on next week so we can um, continue on in it. I won't have to do a review. I can jump right in it. But I'm anxious, kind of anxious to get into chapter 8. We did it once before, but I wanted to go with it with the kind of information. So understand that truth is accumulated. So what we ought to do is not throw away what we learned because Paul is writing to this church and he's going to write some things in chapter 8. Knowing that he already discussed things in chapter 6, 7, 8, he's discussed some things, and he's going to write these things knowing that he's already laid those foundations. All right? No questions, comments, anybody? We good? All right. I'm going to ask my wife to come over and um, get a little close to the phone and uh, have close us out in prayer. Behind it. Just get where we can, you know, you have to stand in front of this where we can hear you. That's fine. That's thank good. you, Lord. Father God, right. we come to you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we just thank you, Father, for your many blessings. Father God, we just ask you, Father, for, to continue to watch us and direct our paths, Father God. Give us guidance where we need guidance and wisdom where we need wisdom. Father God, help us to live a life that's truly for you, Lord. Yes, God. Help us do what's right at all times. Yes, God. And Father God, we just thank you, Lord. Thank you, We Lord. thank you, Father, for allowing us to see this day, Lord, that we've never seen before, Lord. And Father God, we just thank you, Father, for the health and strength that you've given us, Lord. Thank you. We ask you Lord, that you will continue to walk with us, Father God, that you will help us, Father, to be good Christians, to be good warriors for you, Lord, to help to be bold witnesses, Father God. For you, Help Lord. Us, God. Help us. And Father God, we ask you, Lord, that you would just direct us, Father God, as who you want us to help, Lord, because truly we're supposed to be servants. Yes, yes. So help us to do what you want us to do, Father, and that you called us to do. And Lord, we just thank you in advance for all things, Lord. We ask you, Lord, that you continue to watch over and keep us as only you can, Lord. Protect us from all hurt, harm, and danger, Father. Those things that we see as, as well as the things that are unseen, Lord. We ask you, Lord, that you would watch over the leadership, Lord, and that you would touch. Those yes, in charge of the United States, Father God. Yes, God be merciful. Lord, that you would just direct their past, Father God. Lord, give them a heart to watch over all people, not just some people, Father God. And Lord, we just, not only him, Lord, but his entire staff, Father God. 
And then, Lord, we ask you that you will touch each and every governor who's trying to do the best they can yes, do God. with what they got to work with. And, Lord, we just ask you, Father, that you just keep us and comfort us, Father God, in this time of storm, Lord. Yes, you call it and you let us know that you are totally in full control, Lord. Yes. All things are going crazy, Lord. The weather is going crazy and the dams are breaking and the diseases are out there, Lord. But, Lord God, just continue to help us to keep faith in you, Lord, and to hold on to your unchanging hands, Lord. And, Father God, we just thank you, Father. We ask you, Lord, for wisdom and guidance, Father God. And, Lord, just touch our hearts, Father God, that we'll be more like you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless y'all. Have a blessed weekend. Amen. Good night, everybody. Amen. 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 Amen.